Welcome to the Entree Pastors Podcast on YouTube. This is a show that helps pastors think, act, and thrive as prosperous entrepreneurs. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Entree Pastors Podcast on YouTube. My name is John Sanders. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, along with my partner, Les Hughes. And on this week's episode, you're getting ready to hear from a pastor. He's an awesome guy, has a name that's a little bit difficult to spell, but his name is Yanni Gratzinopoulos. Good luck with that one. But he has an incredible story about being... Uh, having a desire to just be a pastor. That's really all he ever wanted to do. And yet, due to some circumstances, he ended up having to go out into the marketplace and maybe at first kind of resisted that. But he found something very interesting. He found that many of the skills that he utilized in pastoral ministry were highly sought after and rewarded in a corporate marketplace setting. And so he has an incredible story of how he has, for many years now, been active in both pastoral ministry and marketplace ministry. He does an awesome job coaching other pastors and business leaders. And we talk to him about all of that and more in this episode of the Andre Pastors podcast. So without any further ado, let me cut to this interview I did recently with Yanni Gratzinopoulos. Check this out. Well, Yanni, welcome to the Entree Pastors Podcast, my friend. It's great to have you joining us today. Hello, everybody. John, thank you for having me. Man, so uh, you and I met here recently online. We connected, and I could tell just by your bio or the description, like, I think this guy is in our tribe. And right before we hit record, you affirmed that with me as we uh, we're just sharing briefly a little bit of your story. Like, I think our people are going to get you and they're going to get the journey that you've been on. So if you don't mind, give a little bit of an introduction of yourself to our audience, specifically as it pertains to how you got into pastoral ministry, and then we'll flip the gears a little bit and get into more of the business side of things, the marketplace. So go ahead, man. Perfect. John, again, thank you for having me. Welcome to uh, the audience that's watching and listening um, like many of you, I, I felt the call. Uh, I was young when I felt the call, went to Bible college, uh, was about to launch off into an evangelistic ministry. And I had a mentor of mine say, no, 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 hold on. Come under somebody else's ministry first and learn. And so I did. Uh, I was an assistant youth pastor. Some of you didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, and then I youth pastored for a while, launched out in the evangelistic ministry uh, for about 15 years, traveling and speaking. And I would have pastors come up to me, I think in part because they could tell I knew what I, I was talking about, mostly because I was just an outside voice, um, although I've always had a gifting to work with people that way. And so they said, hey, how do I do this or how do I do that? And we would start these relationships. And back then, I, we didn't call it what we call it now. It, it wasn't a term even in any world. Uh, I was just helping pastors. Um, eventually, I got back into the pastoral gig. And uh, I, I've done just about everything other than women's ministry. I've done children's ministry. I've been a youth pastor, uh, senior associate, uh, and even a senior pastor. And at one point, I crossed a line I never wanted to cross. Uh, I had to be bivocational. And the Lord was asking me to do it. And so I, I didn't even know. I took a step into the business world. I had a buddy who said, I literally told him, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. He goes, well, come sell for me. I'm like, I don't know how to sell. He goes, you're a preacher. You know how to sell. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> so he, he started teaching me the ropes. And, uh, but then the Lord started moving. The company found out what I did uh, on the other side of life. And a year and a half later, I was a, a corporate trainer and coach for a fortune 200 company. Uh, and then I started winning some awards and made some moves into some different coaching arenas within uh, the business world within that Fortune 200 company. And over the last 10 years, moved in and out of ministry and sales and uh, coaching. Uh, my last business coaching stint, I started as a performance coach, and then I ran uh, all the coaches, and then I was the director of operations. Uh, and about a year ago, closing in on a year ago, the Lord was like, I need you to come coach pastors, and I, I need you to focus on it. Um, and it's been an incredible ride, uh, even to the point of this podcast right here. 
Well, I love that. So you, you've been in multiple roles in, you know, the ministry, you know, pastoral type roles, and then also been in the business side of things. Was there a season where you're doing both? Like, like I heard you say bivocational, and I want to drill down into that in a minute, but when you really were kind of hitting your stride in this coaching arena, were you also pastoring in that same season? Like, was there time that you had a foot in both worlds? Oh, I, I've always had a foot in both worlds. Even still, um, are you still pastoring somewhere as of today? Yeah. So yeah, we have a, a small little home church. Um, but my ministry now, this is actually, my ministry now is my business. Yep. My, my business is my ministry. Um, in, and it, that's weird, right? For, for 10 years, they were completely separate worlds. Uh, although I used to say I pastored in the marketplace, um, but, but they were very different worlds. Um, well, can I just push back for a minute? Yeah, it's only please. weird if you have a worldview that somehow is able to separate and compartmentalize the sacred from the secular, which we do so much of the time, even though on the test, we all get the answer. I go, no, it's all sacred. But yet so much of our mindset goes, well, what happens inside the four walls of this building we call a church and in this pulpit or in my office? Well, that's ministry and that's sacred. But then once it's out there in the marketplace, I guess it's just icky business. And and so that's only weird if you have that mindset. But if we can understand that it's all sacred, that doesn't sound weird to me at all. It's interesting that you say that because it took me years to really start to graph that and then to realize oh, I need to be teaching my people this. This is, I'm doing what I need them to do. They should be sharing Christ and, and building mini churches in their organizations, it, at their work, at their school, whatever they're doing. But it really, you're, you're right, John, I had to break out of some boxes I didn't even realize I had been in. I even still use the terms, in which you caught me on. Thank you. Well, and I wasn't calling you out. I'm just saying like, it's, should be. it's, it's there, man. Like it's a real thing. It's what, it's one of the reasons we do this podcast, but Hey, backing up in the story a minute. Normally I ask this question before now, where in the world are you right now? Yanni, where am I speaking to you from? I am in Idaho in the Boise metropolitan area. Got you. Now, have you always been there throughout this journey or have you moved no, all no. over the place in this oh. journey? Oh yeah. We've in the, in, <laughs> uh, what have we done four or five states, 12 houses, uh, almost, I mean, the moving has been probably the most difficult part. Um, success and failure tended to have brought moving. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, is that, that in the that church the world constant. or the business world or both? Both. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Well, it's both. good to know. It's not just pastors that deal with that. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. Well, I want to go to the, you had mentioned uh, a minute ago, like you did not want to be bivocational. Tell me more about that. Like what does bivocational mean to you? And, and why was there such a reluctance to have to do that bivocational thing? You know, I knew I was called to ministry and, and I knew specifically I was called to, to a preaching ministry and that's all I wanted to do. I didn't even want to be bivocational in college which meant I didn't actually want to do the work of college. I could give a rip about my math or my history of civilization. I wanted to preach. I, I wanted people getting saved. That, that uh, singular focused. And if you look at my college transcripts, you will see that. In, it will confirm that. In stark evidence. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be in the business world because I wanted to preach. Um, what I started to realize is Oh, as I got into ministry, there's a lot of business in ministry. Mm. No one told me that. I never got to see that kind of behind. I mean, I knew there was some, but there's five, six days of business before you get to preach. <laughs> right. It, it doesn't, if you're an evangelist, if you're a pastor. And so that was kind of a rude awakening. Then when I got into the business world, realizing Oh, there's platforms for ministry. In fact, this is where ministry actually happens. And that's where I started to shift my mindset as a pastor, where my job is to raise up the workers to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, how can I do that if I've never been in this world? And so right. it was, there were a lot of rude awakenings uh, that I underwent over the last 10 to 20 years. 
I love that. I see our culture is changing dramatically around us and, and the church so often seems to be wired to resist change and to embrace status quo and just really fight to ever change things. And so the future that I see happening in the church is that th there was a time maybe where much ministry happened inside the four walls of the church, and we invited the culture, come on in here where we can do ministry with you. And those days are quickly leaving us, where the, the unsaved world around us is coming into the doors of our church building. We've got to go out there. I mean, we've got to be missionaries. I mean, Jesus kind of said it a few thousand years ago, that's what this is supposed to be. But I love what you said, like... So we as pastors are equippers of God's people to be out doing that, but how much better can we equip them when we also are on the front lines of ministry where ministry is happening in the marketplace? So it's one of the many things I love about pastors being in, in the marketplace, because it's a common theme we hear all the time is that their pastors are saying, I, I have more ministry opportunity out there than I do inside this building. Well, and how, how can you train somebody on something you've never done? yourself yeah. right and so there's an aspect does that mean that every pastor needs to go out and, and go get a secular secular job even more terminology we call it no i'm not saying that but but we have to be people who understand what we're supposed to be doing that's one of the things i coach pastors on what are you doing and why are you doing it and the fact that so many of them have never really stopped and sat back and said wait where am i going and so when I look at this and I look at where pastors are, we were never supposed to be this way. We were never supposed to look at the world and say, hey, come to us. This is where we can do ministry. Now, I understand some of the reasons why we got there, but it, this was always a train that was on tracks where the bridge was out. And, and we're, we have to get our people. I have a good friend of mine um, who he actually stepped away from pastoring for quite a long season and he went and worked i can't say the name of the company but a large large company um he started planning churches in the company mm. he was a church planner now that. the company didn't know that he had a title <laughs> he planted multiple churches within this company that still meet in the conference rooms in the break rooms in the in the and and it was it's a radical shift of of looking at ministry man that is i love that thought of churches being planted in the break rooms of you know corporate america all across the, the the nation and around the world i actually one time not too long ago was coaching a pastor who had a really cool opportunity a friend of his was a was an entrepreneur and had a business that was in multiple cities and it was a business that was growing and he was talking to my this client of mine about the potential of bringing him into the company but as more of a chaplain but and so again, he he wasn't saying plant churches here, but we were having those kinds of discussions. Like personally, I I, I kind of gag on the word chaplain because to me, I just hear like someone that's holding your hand while you're dying and you know just <laughs> deeply caring for you. But but like man, to be a pastor of the people in this organization and to to get that role to be paid at a corporate level to go do that, I mean, it's incredible. You know, I, I love that thought. Well, and there's organizations now run by Christian leaders who, who, who are sit, saying, wait a minute. And see, this is where as pastors, look, I, I feel like there's a level of us that we're missing it because some of our lay people are going, hold on, I run an organization of 300 people. This is my church. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring in professional Christian workers to work in my church. Why can't we get there as pastors? Our people are getting there. and 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 man, if we can just start to grab a hold of this, um, because revival, renewal, regeneration, with the church growing to where it needs to be, we've we've been doing what we've been doing for the last 40 years. And now mm -hmm. we're here. Look, any business coach will tell you, how long have you been doing what you're doing? That long? Okay. Yeah. And now you're here. We've got to change what you've been yeah. doing. That's yeah. coaching 101. You're getting the results that uh, that your system has been perfectly built to deliver. So every time, obviously, something needs to change there in a big way in the church world. Um, so when you were making that switch, kind of you, you have this mindset of I'm just all in on ministry. I just want to preach. I just want to see the kingdom of God grow. But now you're moving into this more uh, marketplace type thing, which you resisted. 
what was it that caused you to say, well, I need to look at this? Was it just the financial aspect of I yep. need money, like plain and simple? That's what it yeah, was? It was, just, it was flat out the ministry that I was doing couldn't support, which, by the way, is becoming more and more of a trend as we look yeah. at the Barna numbers that continuously come out. Um, e even, and I, I mean, I won't go into that too much, but big churches are really an amalgamation of small churches that have closed um not entirely but but the numbers are pointing that way people are not coming every week they're coming once or twice a month it, it, the face of church especially in america is looking very different yeah. and and most churches just can't financially support that like i said it was a rude awakening i got in to make money and and i realized oh i should have been here much earlier and mm. all along wow um but the other side of that, John, is, is I had this awareness that, that <laughs> church was more business than I realized, but it wasn't until I got into business that I sat back and I'm like, oh, and I sucked at it and mm. I wasn't doing it right. And that's a massive thing. Churches don't have to become organized 501c3s. But if you're an organized 501c3, you're a corporation, you're yeah. a business, you're a not for profit business, but you're a business. Yeah. And until we as pastors realize that the line between business and church is not really a line, we're going to continue to struggle. Yeah, I've often heard that critique that the church shouldn't be learning from the business community and taking principles from the business world. And I've, I've often pushed back on that. I think there's a lot of leadership principles that the church can will be better off if we understand. I mean, certainly we there's there's spiritual truth as well, but I mean all truth is truth. So if it's truth in the business world, it's still truth in the church and which they're taking well from us. Yeah. They 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 are they are taking biblical concepts. There are people in the business world who tithe and they'll tell you, I don't know. I don't know why it works. I just know when I give 10% away and and they'll call it all sorts of things. I'm like, it's tithing. It's yeah. thousands of years old. It's biblical. So it's they're using biblical truths. And and look, it doesn't matter where you glean it. To your point, if if truth is truth, but we're, we're, again, we've got to let's go back to is what we're doing working? Do we even know why we're doing it? Do we have the vision of where we're going? It doesn't matter if you're in the business world or the church world. These are these are truth principles. Get yeah. on board with it. I love that. So one thing that I find a lot with pastors, another like sticking point with, with them moving out into the marketplace, even when they recognize like the financial need is there, then here's another hurdle I see. It's pretty common is for them to say, well, what, what could I do out in the marketplace? I'm just a pastor. I just have a yeah. seminary degree. I just have a Bible college degree or in my case, a, a associate's degree and putting out fires, I'm a firefighter. So it took me five years to get that two-year piece of paper. Um, know that feeling. Different story. But but here's the thing, like I, I heard you say earlier in your story that that once you got into the marketplace, they picked up on some things from your other life, meaning church world, they see some things in you and go, wait a minute, you actually have something to offer in this space. Talk more about that, because there's pastors right now sitting here scratching their head going, I don't know what I would do out in the marketplace, and they think they don't have anything to offer. What would you say to that pastor? <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to look right at you, and I'm going to say, uh, you're dead wrong. <laughs> and here's why. You are a professional public communicator. Let's start with that. Good. You have years of professional experience managing groups of people. Those two pieces right there alone could get you a large swath of jobs. There's a lot of organizations right now. They don't care that you even know their industry. Can you manage their people? In fact, they almost don't want you to know their industry because things are moving to remote, office structure and culture is changing. They need somebody to come in who just understands people. We're pastors. Mm -hmm. That is what we do hopefully, right? So you're a professional public communicator, you're a professional manager, you, you thrive. In, and by the way, you're managing people who are a, a volunteer army, which is the most craziest thing on the planet in the business world. 
Because in the business world, everybody leans back on do this or you're fired. Right. And you never have, they're trying to change that. You're ahead of the game. You just have to, and this is where, this is where understanding, right? As pastors, we come from a place of humility, which is a really good thing. From a, so I'm going to, I'm going to put it in your speak. And this is how, because I struggled with the same thing. If you need to package what the Lord has done in your life in a way that gives him glory, but adequately reflects what he has built in you mm -hmm. so that the world out there understands, yep, we need more of that. Wow, that's really good. So tell me about, here's what I want to do is I want to go down the road of coaching. I want to save a little bit of this conversation for backstage, but there's some of it out here that I want our, our audience to hear. How did you get into coaching? Like later we'll talk about what would you say to a, another pastor who's wanting to get started? And I also, am going to ask you about the difference between coaching pastors versus, you know, business professionals. We'll save that for backstage, but, but how did you specifically get into the world of coaching? Um, I, I, I think for me personally, coaching more found me, um, yeah. even when I was in college, um, I, I would listen. Bad coaches talk, good coaches listen. Mm. And so I would listen and I would listen and I would let people talk. And then I would distill what they would say and say, did I capture this? Yeah, that's it. Have you tried this? No, let me go try that. That's the essence of coaching. And so when I, when I was an evangelist, I would get into conversations with these pastors and we, we would just keep the conversation going. They had a need. It started as a sounding board. And then that sounding board turned into coaching. So that's, and that's the misnomer with coaching. Coaching is not a counseling. Counseling looks backwards to fix what's in the present. Coaching looks at the present a little backwards to fix the direction of the future. So that's the first misnomer. And the second misnomer is coaching is not consulting. Now there's times where I have to do some consulting or training. I'd rather not. I'd rather you get involved and, and let me be that sounding board. And I'm in my happy spot. If I'm able to ask questions to get you moving in the right direction. So what I'm hearing you say is that you were coaching people long before you realized that it was coaching and before the culture started really calling it coaching, you were doing that. And somewhere along the line, you saw that I could actually use this skill that I'm already serving people with to be a profitable source of revenue in my life. Is that a fair summary? Everything except the end. Okay. I, di I didn't see it. In fact, it was the, it was the business world. I saw the training side, they picked up on that, but it was the business world that said, okay, I need you to move from training to coaching. Oh, what's, I didn't even know what's coaching. It's this, 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 this. And that's when I started to go, oh gosh, I've been doing that for years. You hmm. gave that a title. Okay. I can do that in the business world. Right. Um, by the way, the business world, and Jesus even said this, the business world is so much better at being shrewd among financial things. They're also so much better at naming and marketing things, right? Mm -hmm. We don't in the church world, everything's helping people. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But one of the things you'll probably find in the business world is they're going to look at you and go, oh, in fact, I have a friend who's a marketer, former pastor. He's now the head of content marketing for a fortune 500 company because the, the skill set was always there. But it was when he got into the marketplace that they said, hey, you're good at this. And it started to develop. Hmm. And, and that's really how it developed for me. I love that. So before we wrap up this portion of the interview and, and head backstage, I really want to, I'm going to go deeper in the, the coaching world with you um, and just have a conversation around that. What other thoughts come to mind knowing our audience? We've got pastors out there right now. Some are already far down the road of just they're serial entrepreneurs. They're making a ton of money. They're leading healthy churches, and they've figured this out. And by the way, a little side note to that, why don't we know the fact that they're – why don't we know about these pastors? Why is this not something that everybody knows? Well, I would contend they don't have a community where they can go celebrate – 
their successes in business. Like it's the average pastor that has a successful business cannot walk into his or her church and be like, guys, I just had an incredible month, best ever in my business. You know, we just made six figures in, in the month. They can't do that. Like most normal Christians, normal churches in our culture would not have a place in their, they have a framework for a pastor that's barely getting by financially, but not that. So anyway, we've got, or even the pastor community, you can't walk into your, your morning coffee with all your pastors and say that they'll think you're losing your salvation. Yeah. And you're double-minded and you're not focused on, on the, you know, this one thing I do, that's what Paul said, this one thing I do. Right. And it's funny how we twist some of that out of context, but we've got those people, but I would contend we have many more in our audience that are probably further back on that journey. There are, some are sitting on the edge going, man, this sounds attractive. I don't even know if I could do that. They've got some roadblocks in their way. I really want you to speak to that part of our community that's sitting there today wondering, is this for me? Can I get like, what would you say to encourage them, to inspire them, to push them over the edge? Like, what would you say to those, those people? So I'm going to say a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, Stop pastoring by yourself. Good. So many pastors are so solitary. And you're probably wondering, can I do this? Should I do this? Because outside of listening to this podcast, you're not talking to anybody about it. Maybe your spouse. Look, that's why people like John and I exist, hmm. right? Do you need specifically us? No. Could you have other people in your life? Yeah. But get out, talk with some people. Talk with some people who are in the business world. Talk with some people who are in the ministry world. Start, there is, what does the Bible say? There's wisdom in the counsel of many, but we don't do that as pastors. Why? Fear, fears of the devil. Get rid of it, step outside, number one. Number two, look, if you don't have to go now into the business world, then wait for a bit. Well, hold on, what does that mean? I'm not saying you sit there and move idly by. But it was Warren Buffett who said that the stock market is the financial exchange from the impatient people to the patient people, <laughs> right? So his whole thing is don't just get into the market to get into the market. You wait for the right time and the right opportunity. Pastor, if you need to get into it now, then get into it now. If you don't, then take a step back and start praying about some of your ideas, right? Don't, don't. If you've ever watched Shark Tank, we always focus on the people who are like, well, that was a stupid idea. Okay, maybe your first idea isn't going to come, but start to process through some of your ideas. And, and this is where you really should focus. Where is the need? It works the same in the business world. We do this so well in the church world. Where is the need? Is there a need in your community? Is there a need in your local area? Is there a need in your uh, sphere of influence where you are that that you can monetize. That's business. That is business 101. Is there a need that you can fulfill for monetary compensation? So whether that's a job, John, you said something that was incredible. There are organizations that are looking for chaplains. Hmm. Uh, is there a need that you can fill and you can monetize that filling? There's a thousand ways to skin that cat. Like John said, we'll talk about some coaching, which is great for pastors. And you might be like, Yanni, why would you give me the secrets to compete against you? There's more than enough business. Yeah. I, I, I can't handle it all. I, I join me. Come on. Yeah. But but let me say this to you. John and I were talking about this before the show. I give you permission, right? By the way, Jesus preached in the synagogues. Yes. He preached in the marketplace. In fact, he spent more time preaching in the marketplace. Yep. Come, come join us. Yeah, that's good. I love the, that, that concept of permission. I really do because not that they need it. I mean, they already have it. I believe they don't need anyone's permission. The way we've structured the church so much of the time, it's like, oh, I got to get permission from the board or from the staff or from whoever. It's like, no, God called you to your ministry and you don't need to wait around on someone else's permission. But that's the value of having community to walk beside you through this. And you kind of referenced that earlier. You know, if you're in isolation, that fear can be paralyzing. You get in a group of people that are encouraging you, supporting you, pushing you, that that the fear is minimized and they'll push you through that fear and help you, you know, walk beside you through that journey. So I love that, man. Just that call to permission for pastors to 
to move forward. So one last question for you before we wrap up out here on the front stage in the bright lights. Um, if someone wanted to reach out and connect with you, maybe for coaching or to, to carry this conversation further, like is what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Carrier your pigeons. We really operate. And I'm just kidding. Those are great. Um, <laughs> people are like, wow, who is this? Uh, so our website is grotsllc.com, G-R-A-T-S-L-L-C.com. Um, and there is a ton of resources. In fact, we have a, a full page dedicated to free resources. There are blogs uh, and, and res- specifically talking through so much of what we've talked about. Stop fighting alone. Get the rest that you need. Uh, even stuff around some of the marketplace. I've done some business owner stuff that applies to pastors. There's an evaluation page for you to evaluate your ministry and your life. And am I stuck? All of it's free. Um, and then that's where our phone number is there. It's, there's a contact me page there. Um, it gives you all of that information. Um, and f- like John said, for those of you that are sticking around, I'm, I'm going to give you as many behind the scenes tr- tips, tricks, and secrets that I can about how I got started, what it means, what it looks like, um, because there is need, there is not enough of me, and this is absolutely something that can be monetized. Oh, I love that. And that's a great place to maybe wrap this part of it up. Yanni, I got to tell you, man, I, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe God brings people across our path on purpose and for a purpose. And so one of the things I love about what we're doing here at Andre Pastors is we're connecting with leaders and pastors in the marketplace and in, in ministry, just like you all over the country. And uh, so I'm grateful for your time, grateful for your pouring into our audience today. I know some people are going to take real value from this conversation. So thank you so much, my friend. Thank you, John. And thank you to everybody listening and watching. Well, hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Entree Pastors podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can be notified every time we release a new episode. If you'd like to get connected to other pastors who are learning to think, act, and thrive as prosperous entrepreneurs, then we invite you to check us out on Facebook. Just search for the Entree Pastors Connect group, answer a few of our simple questions there, and we'd love to include you in the conversations. And if you're really ready to go to the next level, then we invite you to join our Entree Pastors membership community. When you become a monthly subscriber, you will receive access to courses, exclusive community, and coaching that will help you along in your own Entree Pastors journey. If there's anything else we can do to serve you, please visit us at entrepastors.com and we will do our best to serve you there. God bless everybody. See you soon.